What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I'm here with Audra Brem of Brem Media. And before I formally introduce Audra, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out, Audra. And so our mutual friend, Jason Swank, I have two episodes with him, and uh, he talks about how he built up his agency and then eventually sold it. He talks about another episode of what he's looking for when they're acquiring agencies and how he evaluates them. Um, Other people in in Audra and I are in uh, the mastermind, uh, in Jason's mastermind. We just hung out in in Colorado. There's some other episodes I did with other mastermind members. Um, Guillaume Latal specializes in Magento development and design. So talk about a niche. Uh, Lisa Larson Kelly, founder of Quantius, specializes in emerging technology. And she has some of the biggest companies on the planet as clients. So check those episodes out. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. In Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for you to launch and run your podcast. You know, Audra, we know each other a little bit. Then, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to profile over the past 10 years, the companies and the people I most admire and let them share the knowledge with other people as well. So if you've thought about starting a podcast, you should, if you have questions, go to rise25.com and learn more. We both, John Corker and I have been doing it for over a decade now. So uh, it's the best thing we've ever done. Today's episode, I'm excited to introduce Audra Brem. She's a founder and visionary of Brem Media. Uh, They're a social media marketing agency specifically focused in the beauty and fashion industries. Uh, She'll never say she is a social media marketing expert uh, because she believes you can never be an expert in this field. It's always changing, right? Uh, But she does speak across the country on how to make social media actually work for your business and make you money. And there are certain fundamental principles that Audra follows to make things work. So Audra, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. I know that this is long overdue, so I'm excited. I love talking to you. Likewise. I want you to start with just tell people uh, Brem Media and what you do. Yeah. So very similar to what you just said, which is so Brim Media is a social media marketing agency. We specifically focus in the beauty and fashion industries, but our whole focus is the sales funnel. So getting people off of social media onto your website and into an email marketing drip campaign so that you yourself, your business can actually make money and not just sit there and cross your fingers, dot your eyes, cross your T's, all the fun stuff. You actually want to make money and scale, and that's what we do. So I know things are always changing. So we'll talk about a little bit, you know, some of the fundamentals, what's working and what is not working on social media. I mean, social media keeps me out, keeps me on my toes like 99% of the time. I always say that usually when I'm on a call, something changes and it always does. So I like to put a little disclaimer out, which is whenever you're listening to this, just maybe message me and make sure that those things do apply at that exact moment, because we just never know what's going to change and what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen in five minutes, let alone in a year. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, when I have some of the top direct response marketers, copywriters on the podcast, you know, it's all a test. Even if you think it will work or it has worked for one brand or one company, it's always a test. So you're always testing. What's some stuff right now at this point in time um, that is working with social media? Yeah. So on social, and I think this is across the board for marketing in general, is being authentic. And I think that is such a crucial element of any brand or any creator, anybody in general is just being true to why you started your company or why you started branding yourself. 
because ultimately consumers are so much smarter than we give them credit for. If we act like used car salesmen, and sorry to all those used car salesmen out there, but you get the gist, then we are not going to actually retain the customers that we really want. It's going to be like a quick turn and burn instead of retaining customers that ultimately always come back. And that's a successful business. That's so important on social is just being authentic and being true to yourself. Do you see any examples? We don't have to name names of companies or people, but they may be trying to be authentic. I don't, I don't know if <laughs> trying to be authentic is a thing, but that you see that they're maybe trying a little bit too hard and you'd maybe give them some tips. So what's an example of, you know, oh, they may be thinking we're being authentic and you're like, well, it's a little bit too I much. Yeah. So to your point, I think the hardest piece of this about being authentic is sometimes it's almost like when you're in high school and you're trying to find yourself and you don't necessarily know who yourself is. I think companies and brands are kind of always there. They try to always say, this is who we are. This is who we are. This is who we are. And in reality, the customer really helps define who you are. So you really need to listen to your customer. Right now, uh, we have clients that try to do it too, which drives me crazy. Shout out to them because they know it. Um, But across the board right now, overproduced videos are horrible for authenticity because it just doesn't look like no one wakes up, to be very honest, with like full hair and makeup. Like, let's just be real. I, <laughs> I don't even right have now. that throughout the day. So yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jeremy, your hair looks great. What are you talking yeah, about? <laughs> the lack thereof, yes. <laughs> but no one wakes up like that. So if you're putting out all of the all of this content and these ads and all of that, that's like full hair and makeup people trying to get to your consumer, that's not authentic. Those people don't see themselves in that. Now, if you're a makeup company and you're showing them how to do their makeup or getting creators, right? To actually do it for you and all of that stuff, that makes more sense or giving tips. I think the huge thing about being authentic right now is not showing, but it's doing. I know I've had tons of conversations in the past about this, which is I literally, that's why this has taken so long. I hate telling people what to do. I would rather show people and help them and see how they apply it to their businesses But right now, there's a lot of showing. This is what we do on marketing. We just show people what they should do. And in in reality, we should be helping them along, like giving them tools to help them along. Let's talk about that company or that brand that you're working with. And and there's influencers within that brand or company. What if they're thinking, you know what, I, you know, Audra, I want to show up and I want to, you know, if I'm exemplifying fashion and beauty, I want to show up like that. Yep. So how do you get them over that, you know, mindset that you can just show up, you know, like you rolled out of bed sometimes? Yeah. So I'll say that we test both. We'll we'll take their idea and we'll go, okay, like if you don't want to trust us and that's fine because who knows, this could absolutely work for the audience. Why don't we test this and put it out there? But at the same time, we're going to split test, do an A-B test and show the same thing that we're talking about at the same time. That's obviously on advertising and email marketing, not on organic content. So that's a little bit different. But when you're thinking about ads and email, you can easily do a split test to show what your audience is looking for. We've been wrong. I'm not going to say that we're always 100% right because you just can't be, right? Again, I keep saying things change so quickly, but at the end of the day, we do know this sphere and this niche so well that we do know what they're looking for. And right now it is that girl or boy next door that they feel like they can see themselves in rather than the overdone person. We call this the Kim Kardashian effect, which is a good thing or a bad thing, which is you can take your company and do the Kim Kardashian, which is have that influencer come in that is overdone. And maybe that is your audience. Maybe like it works for Botox and it works for injections and lip plumpers and all of those things. But if you're just a like 
girl or boy next door fashion company that you're trying to get like the mid-tier to upper tier consumer, they don't want to see the person that has plastic surgery 24-7 because then they themselves are looking at themselves and judging themselves going, well, I don't look like that. So why can I look good in those? And that's where authenticity has to come into play. You have to know your audience. If you don't know your audience, there's a clear issue that's happening in marketing. And that does happen all the time. So I don't have one to show of this split test. Like here's the overproduced image and here's the authentic raw image. Yeah. But when you think of a test that you've done, can you walk me through um, so I can visualize what did that overproduced image, what was on that overproduced image versus the the raw authentic one? Yeah. So that, that beat it out. So, and in this case that I'm talking about, which I'm trying not to name names because, yeah. you know, all the good things. But we have actually a creator slash influencer that does this, that she has been told to do production. So have a camera crew, have hair, have makeup, have all of this stuff, and it's going to brand you better. Those videos have flopped on organic, on email, on ads, all three. The selfie video that is her crying, talking about our real life experience has gone viral on every platform we put it on. And it's because it's real and you feel like someone is speaking to you rather than someone speaking at you. So there's a clear difference there, which is the overproduction, the hair, the makeup crew, the video crew, the script that's telling you what you should be saying and then speaking from your heart, right? Like I am, when I speak in front of people, I never have scripts which is probably the dumbest thing. Who knows? Give or take. I don't know. It probably is. But 99% of the time I like black out and forget what I talked about. But those are usually the best, <laughs> the best ones I have because I'm speaking from my heart and I'm talking about real life experiences rather than reading from a script going, this is what I have to do. That is marketing. We can't be scripted. You have to be true to what the brand is, who you are, and what you want to put out there. And sometimes we get in our head a lot and then over overdo it, right? So then we're like, oh, this crying video has done so well. We only have to do those. Well, that's not true too, because then you just look like a depressing company. It's like, no, don't just do the depressing ones just because it gets to people's hearts. You got to show people in a life cycle. Like, what does it mean throughout that life cycle? So if you're a clothing brand, when I wake up, I want to see a day in the life of someone wearing that that company what does it mean like do they have pajamas great wake up in pajamas if they don't if they're just active wear even then i want to see someone getting up getting ready and doing their day and how it moves and flows that will sell clothing more than anything else out there yeah i mean being authentic is pretty evergreen when we talk about things and yes. when you talk about this what sticks out um, we talk about trying to be authentic, whatever it is, but it, it's really a lot of it is being vulnerable. Would you say? Yes. yes. Well, because the big thing here is this goes back to like that scripted feel when you're not at your most vulnerable, you almost overthink it. At least that's how I have seen things ultimately. So brands tend to question what their mission is more than anyone I think I have ever talked to, especially in these industries, because they're like, we have to have this clear mission. We have to have a clear goal. And while that is true, again, no one knows what's going to happen in a year, in two years, like economic states, so many. Yes, we all read the new, we all read papers, we all talk about it, we listen to podcasts, right? But we can't predict, like no one could predict the pandemic ultimately, right? So like things change and we have to be on our toes to be able to be nimble to change and be vulnerable with that. So like if your audience is skewing younger than you really wanted to, but you're actually getting revenue from it, maybe start to reevaluate, well, this is actually a good thing for us. We should be going after the younger crowd. Like analytics are the biggest piece of any marketer's job 
or any brands. Like if you're a brand and you're not sitting there going, I need to look at the numbers and it's not just vanity metrics. Like please, if anybody can take anything out of this, please stop looking at how many followers or likes you have. Start looking at how many people are coming from social media to your website into an email funnel because that is where your money is. And that is where those customers that are your biggest fans are. And if you can gain those biggest fans, then you will be successful years down the road. So a couple things, and and I'd love to hear anything else that you feel is working, being authentic, vulnerability, listening to your customer and, and, you know, Mm -hmm. taking that data and bringing it into the marketing and day in the life, which is kind of just showing the life cycle. Yeah. What else um, works on social right media? Right now, videos trump everything. In the world of TikTok, it's short form videos, though YouTube has a huge presence. So there's so many different things to this when it comes to videos, right? I talk about the non overproduction. And yes, the selfie video is great, but an iPhone video or say Android, depending on what you use. I never like to count out people because just because I'm an iPhone doesn't mean anything. So when you're using it, it's just making sure you have the ring light and you, and yes, that's production, but it also is more of a lighting situation (laughs) than anything. The big thing here is knowing the social platform that your audience is on and what they're looking for. So when we talk about videos, TikTok, yes, people are like, oh, that's just for the younger generation. In reality, the biggest audience there is from 30 to 45, and it's moms. So if you are going after moms and you're not on TikTok, we have a bigger issue of why, right? And that's more of the conversation of trying to figure out, well, what are we supposed to do there? I don't want to just dance. You don't have to dance again, right? It's all about helping people help people on TikTok, do things like that. But then this goes back to like my big social media sales funnel, which is what's working now is getting people from different social channels to other social channels to your website. So if you have short form video on TikTok, which is working very, very well right now, you want to then move them to YouTube for a longer ended one and maybe even give them more tips hints, tricks, all of the fun stuff, right? Give them more information for them to even be sold even more to get to your website. And then once they're on their website, if they're not purchasing right away, then you need to be able to get them into that email funnel. But ultimately it is the first three seconds on a video that is the most crucial. And that's across the board on any social platform. It's funny you say that, Audra. So we have a monthly team meeting um, and we have an icebreaker question. And one of the icebreaker questions uh, a couple months ago was, um, what's your biggest vice, right? And there were three team members who are fit exactly your description, probably like 28 to 40 mm-hmm. moms. And three people said, my vice is watching hours TikTok. of TikTok videos. Yeah. <laughs> yes, It's probably mine. I was like, really? I didn't know. I'm like, what channels are you listening? You know, are you watching? So, yeah. Oh my gosh. It's more of it. it, Like, again, I'm in my thirties. I'm a mom. I'm part of a run club. Like all we do when we're not working is literally send each other TikToks. Like that is the way of the world. We're not on Facebook anymore. That doesn't mean people are not on Facebook. It just means who you thought were there is not there. I call Facebook grandma book before a reason. It is older. It skews older. Instagram and TikTok are very similar. They have a younger viewership, though Instagram actually goes a little bit over 40 now um, and more actually male driven than anything. Um, And then you have TikTok. That's It really did come up because of the pandemic, because people were bored and they wanted social interaction and it became fun. And that was so crucial. And YouTube, to be very honest with everyone, I think people thought YouTube was kind of going sour. It's not. It's one of the best social media outlets out there for, especially for information. Like what I know more people that go to YouTube than to Google something because they want immediate information from a video of someone 
helping them. Again, it's all about authenticity of helping. So if you're a brand and you're not giving tips, tricks, even just to style your outfits, then you're missing out. There's your authentic piece of it. Or what does it matter to you, right? So video, short form and long form, as long as you're doing it right, is so crucial. And TikTok is my favorite. It just is. Any other thoughts on what's working or on the flip side, what's not working? Yeah. So going into 2023, and I know we're talking a lot about social media, but this has a lot to do with it, is email marketing is not a thing of the past. And if anything, I would actually double or triple down on your email marketing, but make it more communicative which means you need to stop telling people to click a button. Please stop in an email going, buy this now. No, no, why? Ask questions. Act, you have to act like these people are your friends. Would you email, like Jeremy, if I was to email you, I wouldn't be like, hey, Jeremy, buy now. You'd be like, what am I buying? Why? Who are, like, talk to me, Audra, <laughs> right? So it's more about talking in an email as if they were your friends. So go about it that way. And that's really, really working for brands in general. Like, again, this goes back to the overproduced email does not work compared to the authentic. Like if you hear me say authentic one more time, you could probably make this a drinking game. But I just am, I believe that if you're true to your brand and true to why you started and where you wanna go, you will be successful if done correctly. So that's a huge thing of what's working now. The overproduction, obviously not working. Stop doing it. I'm like really sick of hearing it. And then I think a big one is acting though social media is a commercial on TV. It is not. Please stop making it look like that. It, we are not speaking to, when we're watching TV, we're in a different mindset than we are when we're scrolling social media, right? Like think about the difference right now when you're watching TV. Yes, it's for entertainment purposes. Sometimes it's just to relax and enjoy, right? And yes, commercials are supposed to be disruptive. But when you're on social media, the point is, is the word. You're supposed to be social, interacting, liking people's information, commenting, engaging, so what makes people engage? It's not to disrupt their life, right? It's to help their life. It's to talk to them. So that is the biggest thing that is not working anymore. Stop making social media commercials. Let's talk about email for a second and best practices, yeah. because I've seen this um, and even experienced people and in, in, it is a dialogue and communication. And sometimes I get emails from people and it's like this, a lot of graphic heavy, like it's a newsletter and it's, I don't feel like they're speaking to me individually because my, you know, you're not going to write this email to me, Audra, and then like put like a header on it and all these graphics. So what are some of the best practices to do email right? So there's two different entities of email marketing, which is you have your flows. So like welcome series, comeback series, win backs, all of these different ones. And then you have like your weekly and I speak to the brands, right? So like weekly sales or weekly offers or something in that regard. Your flows should be like a normal email, but not like the old school one. And by old school, I mean like a couple of years ago. So not that old school, but like the long drawn out email. In internet years, like right. You have to like scroll forever. It should be short to the point, but acting as though you're a friend. Like, Hey, Jeremy, thanks so much for joining our mailing list. I'm excited. You can even have like a Loom video of the owner talking to the customer. It makes it feel much more like they're part of this community. We have lost a big sense of community over the past couple of years. And that is what consumers are looking for is to be part of something. So make them feel part of it. A huge thing that we're seeing right now is loyalty programs. And that's a huge piece of the email marketing too, which is why should they be loyal to your brand? What in those welcome series and winbacks and all of that in that copy makes it feel like they should be loyal to you? Well, if you're part of a community and it's not like a Facebook group, right? It's more of 
Who are you? Why should they stand with you? Who are you giving back to? Do you have a nonprofit? Like speaking to those things is so crucial. Then you have your weekly like offers ish. Those can be more of that feeling of like, oh, yep, they're sending things. I get it. But in reality, and this is what I believe is happening, those weekly offers are going much more to SMS. And you should be really focusing on the SMS weekly offers and more of the organic feel communicative emails. So that's where you can split your SMS and email strategy is looking at email as more communicative, speaking. They want to speak to someone real. So even if you don't have the manpower to be able to respond back to all of these emails, just try it at first and see how it goes. Because ultimately, if you're all of a sudden getting that many responses, it means you're growing, which means that maybe you can hire someone for customer service for specific emails, right? But on the SMS side, then you can ultimately send weekly ones that are offers so you can get those sales going too. So from a welcome, so you have the welcome series, you have a win back series and weekly offers. Is win back kind of an abandoned cart series? Is that what you're referring to? Exactly. And there's so many other ones. You have birthday series. You have like, I can literally mention like 30 that we try to do. Um, But the whole point is to do it so you're not annoying. Like don't email people every other day. Please don't. If you're doing that, your customers have given up. It's the, and I hate to say this brand, but I feel like everyone will understand, which is it's like the Bed Bath & Beyond. I knew you were yeah. going to say Bed Bath & Beyond. Yes, yeah. because we all, how many people have those coupons? How many times do you <laughs> use them? Like, I probably could look in my desk drawer right now and find like two for no reason. I don't use them anymore. And the problem is, is they've gotten so much that like everyone knows about them that it's not even exciting. You're like, well, if I don't have a 20% or 15% off there, why am I even going in there? You don't. And ultimately they're hurting right now because no one even goes in there. So don't become the bed, bath and beyond. Don't become the ones that are like always discounting yourself or always feeling like you have to have an offer. Instead, create that loyalty of tips, tricks, hints, collaborate with other brands or other creators to help your business along too to give that content, like give that enrichment in those emails too. So like the welcome email doesn't just have to be like, here's 15% off. It's like, Hey, I would love to help you style like a whole week's worth of clothes for you. Click here or something in that regard, right? Like come to our quiz that talks all about stitch fix does this really well. There are so many ones that are great that do this correctly. But ultimately, I think we're all trying to copy and paste instead of thinking about what our brand is. It's so it's, it's basically just trying to add value yes. to those people. Always. And if you're not adding value, then rethink what you're doing. Like the big thing for me with email and social is don't just post to post and email to email. Have a reason you're doing it and a goal. Like if you don't have a KPI for something, then what's the point of putting it out there? So like so many companies will come to us and talk to us about like, well, how many posts do you do? And it's like, well, that's great. And I'm happy to give you the amount of posts we do, but what's your goal? Like what, what do you want to get to? And this is how we can get to that. I don't want to just say, you have to post seven days a week. Well, you probably don't have to post seven days a week. It's all about what's the value of it. How many assets can we get to make sure that we're successful for you, right? So it is that value add. The quality over quantity. Um, So we mentioned the welcome series, win back series. And this is sometimes like people don't have these in place, I imagine. It's just low hanging fruit. Someone has checked out. They have it sitting in there. And then their child was crying and they had to run (laughs) off. Right. And so if you put yourself in the situation of the real life person, it's not so linear. Um, And then you have weekly offers and you have 30 others of these type of series. I'd love to hear from one of your, one of your clients have said, you know, Audra, I've never thought of that one. What's one that sticks out out of the 30 that 
we can mention that a client has said that to you? Um, I think a really big one that people forget about is if then ones. So if someone does something on your website, then they should go to a certain part of your email flow or if they have not. So we go into like, if they've kicked up, clicked on a certain category in your website, then they should ultimately go into this perfect flow, which is all about, let's say it's only women, right? Then they go into a women only flow. Or if they don't, then they should be going into a general one. People forget about if then statements so much that it's it's interesting to me because you can segment so much more and then you can cater to it and talk to that person even better, right? And then ultimately you have the ability to then retarget that little list on social media with something even better, right? Like talking to them as if you knew that they were. I always laugh about the people that are like, oh, Facebook's listening to me, Meta's listening to me, or Alexa's listening to me. It's like, those are just really good marketers on the other side, guessing what you're doing, right? Like that is what we do and why we do it well, which is we test, we test, we test, but we do a whole lot on the email side to capture what people are actually doing to then retarget them. So if then statements are perfect. I actually, I mean, maybe other people feel differently. I don't mind when I get retargeted because I'm an, I don't have the time at that time point to maybe make the purchase. So I'm like, I hope they retarget me. So like it puts it back in front of me and reminds me to buy it again. So yeah. I, maybe I'm weird and different, but I actually mm -hmm. like that. My favorite thing is being retargeted because it actually means someone's doing their job correctly, which sounds very bad. My biggest pet peeve is being targeted for something that I am clearly not a target for, which means that whoever is advertising for you has zero setup. Like I get so confused. The best example I can give literally just happened to me this morning, which is, and this will be like a clear indicator to you, Jeremy, but I was targeted for a Christmas tree. There is nothing in my life and kudos to everyone that celebrates Christmas. My husband does, but like, I don't look up Christmas trees. I am very much Jewish and I literally have never looked up a Christmas tree. So it was very confusing. I also- How did you get targeted for that though? It's, it was an open targeting. I like went down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out why oh. I was targeted for it. But it basically means that they are, there's a lot of things that you can do because you can't go after religion anymore on most social channels, but you can go after interests. And like Elf on the Shelf is a perfect interest. I would also not be in that interest category. Like there's just so many things that make me laugh. Um, but that's a big pet peeve is like actually target people. Don't just open it to everyone. Yeah. And for people listening and they're like, what is retargeting? You know, I yeah. guess the, the brief explanation is if you go to a website, then that website has, I guess you would say a pixel that yep, it has follows you around the it. internet, a, co a code that follows you around the internet. So you'll start seeing that company's ads on Facebook or Google or YouTube or wherever they have it set up. Is that yep. accurate? So like long story short is if you go on someone's website, they should have a pixel or which is what we call it, right? Or a code on their website that tracks you and your cookies throughout where you go. So like your little breadcrumbs of where you are on the internet. So when you go to like Macy's.com and all of a sudden you go on social media later that day or the next day and you randomly see a Macy's ad, it's not because someone's listening to you. It's because your breadcrumbs have brought you there. So you ultimately have given the information for you to go there. Now, there are obviously ways to opt out of that. I suggest not opting out because ultimately then you get ads that mean nothing to you and you will never care. And then you just get more annoyed about being on social media. I'd rather see things that matter to me or my kids or my husband than anything else. And that's do brands come to you, Audra, and do they have that set up typically or do they, they're just missing the boat? Um, because uh, I feel like that's low hanging fruit. People are already coming to their website and now they can be following them around. 
I think it's a 50, 50 split for people that come to us. Some people have everything set up and are just like, nothing's working. Um, or we have people come to us and go, what are we doing? <laughs> uh, help us, which we love both because ultimately we can see analytics for what has worked before with the people that have things set up and it's built up and we have retargeting possibilities. We have email lists and all of that. Or you have the company that's just scratching the surface of kind of, they were throwing money at the wall everywhere and going, nothing is working. Why? And it's just helping them again, teaching them, right? Talking to them about the guidance of where to go next and how to help the business to be able to be more successful. So it's kind of an array at this point, unless you're a startup, usually you know that you have to have a pixel on your, on your website, but usually they're not done correctly or they've done too many, <laughs> or they have like, we have catalogs on social media channels. So you can sell on meta and TikTok and all of those fun things. Those are usually not set up properly. So that's a bigger thing that we try to clean up very quickly is like, what does this look like? Or else you're selling stuff on these social channels that you haven't had in like two years because they're not just, they're not connected correctly. And that's a bigger entity that we need to clean up very quickly. Who's an ideal fit for you? I don't know, size of company. Obviously you help fashion and beauty brands. What, what does that look like? Yeah. So for us, it's usually from the million dollar revenue per year to the $25 million per year. And that's mostly because we do partner with in-house social teams um, more for the assets because everyone usually has photographers or videographers that they love working with. So we take those assets and utilize them correctly within a strategy and making sure everything's set up for the, the uh, lower revenue fashion and beauty industry brands. We like to make sure that we're helping them get to that other level. So that way we can get them with someone in-house to partner with and all of that too. I'd love to talk a little bit more granular about what you do and through some success stories. Um, and um, there's one in particular um, with Jen. So I'd love for you to talk about what you do with Jen. So Jen, Jen Drummond, she is a, so funny enough, when we say we're fashion and beauty, we also do have another sector, which is entertainment. And Jen Drummond is that. She is a uh, mountaineer, but she's also a motivational speaker. She has, I always think, I'm pretty sure she has seven kids. So Jen, if you're listening to this and I just said it wrong, don't laugh at me um, because she knows that it's a circus and it's so fun. But she's a single mom that got into a almost life-ending accident that changed her view on the world. We built her brand, so herself from nothing to we got her a million views on TikTok. She's already at like 7,000% increase to followers on across all social channels. So she is starting her own um, podcast. She has a, a documentary coming out and a book coming out. But this was all because she just had this idea of becoming the first woman to um, summit all of the second summits in the world, which to anyone that isn't a mountaineer, and I am not, I just learned all of this because I think she's amazing. Um, sh the second summits are actually the more technical ones. So while we hear about Mount Everest and how amazing that is, technically that's not as technical as the second summit there. So she is gonna be the first woman to actually summit all of those. Um, and just from who she is, again, she we just have built her, and she'll be the first one to say this, she didn't know what authenticity is. She was worried and she is the one that I would love to shake and say, do more authentic things because I want her, her followers love the fact that she is real and telling them real life experiences. Again, any person that has kids understands that one is a lot, seven is a whole lot more, plus trying to build a business and be successful and do all of these mountains it's hard to find time in your day to be able to do it all. And she really speaks to that, to her audience. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, she's yeah. remarkable. 
Um, she really is. She like literally makes me feel like I do nothing in life <laughs> all the time. I'm like, wow, all of us. <laughs> I'm lazy. Um, what about you had another company worked with Uptown? Yep. Uptown Boutique. So they are a Midwest boutique. Uh, they are right outside of St. Louis. Um, and they came to us. They were struggling. They really wanted to grow. They weren't struggling, but they really wanted to grow their online sales. And what we did is really establish helping them make sure that they were getting conversions on their website from they did their own organic content, but we really took over their ads and email and making it an actual social media ads funnel, right? And getting sales and converting. This was obviously a little bit ago, but we did get on average a 10.3 ROAS for them. And average now, to be very honest, is a three to five. I like to tell everyone because it's not the same as it used to be when uh, consumer spending was at an all-time high. We're seeing a lower, but that doesn't mean it's crazy low. But what we were doing is making sure the best way I can put it to get really into like the depths of what we do is we are not a set it and forget it agency. We are in the weeds every five seconds. And I really do mean that. We are in ads manager on TikTok, on Meta, on YouTube making sure that things are actually working and not just letting them sit and write it out. We want to see results right away. And if they're not working, we will create new immediately to make sure we get those results. Like it does not matter. We will always make sure there's results. Yeah. And for, if you're listening, ROAS is return on ad spend. So if you think about spending a dollar and making 10 back or spending a dollar and making five back, um, that's pretty darn good. Yep. What is your thought on lifetime value? What's the expectation of the brands typically? So, you know, obviously that's on the initial sale. So are they looking, hey, I want to get three times because I know the lifetime value of this customer is worth a lot. So even returning, you know, mm -hmm. that amount is amazing. What are what are people's expectations? Expectation, funny enough, right now across the board is attribution is right away. A lot of our brands don't look at lifetime and we try to educate people on the lifetime piece of it. Like if you are at a 30% return customer, we should be increasing that and not just going up. Oh, we always need new people in our sales funnel. And it's how this goes back to that loyalty. How do we keep people within that? That also has to do with email right? Making sure that you're communicating to these people, talking to them, getting them into it. I like to see lifetime value ultimately. I mean, it, when you think about, yeah, a three times return right now, think about lifetime. That three times right. return can ultimately be 10 times return. You just got to track exactly. it properly. And right. that's really where we look at things as being at that 10 times return because that person should always be coming back. And you ultimately, like you look at five years down the road, that could be even more. Right. But a lot of brands look at it as we it's spend kind of this, very short sighted that. snapshot. Right. I mean, yes. that's just looking at the initial sale, but there's more sales to come typically. Yes. Right? The hard part is, is in the world that we live in attribution, especially last click and first click has become such a thing of what marketers are like, well, you got this, you got a row as you're good. Um, when we really need to be looking at what is that life cycle and what is that customer journey and where are we dropping off? So yes, social media is, and people always say like they want their social media to be an overnight success. They, they want money from it in three months. And while that's great, let's think about, well, okay, so three months you're getting this, but then what does that mean from a year from now? Did all of those people from in three months just drop off and never come back to you? Why is that? And what's happening? And is it products? Is it pricing? Is it the fact that you literally just are always looking for new customers at all times and not really gaining interest from your current customers? That's a bigger deal. And that's really what we look to is trying to increase actual return customers than just increase new customers. Love it. 
I thought it'd be fun um, to pull up and you were telling me about this. So I wanted to pull a couple of things up yeah. um, with the Facebook ads library. I didn't know that this even existed, but you could do a lot of research on brands and companies on what they've been running over the course. So I pulled up right at this point, it's the Facebook, you know, facebook.com slash ads slash library. And I did some searches here of some cool brands. And I figured we would just talk specifically, I pulled up um, Gooder, G-O-O-D-R. So if you're listening to the audio, I do have this pulled up on the screen share. Um, and because I think it's kind of a cool sunglass company. So I love you break down kind of just in general, what you're seeing as far as images or videos and some of the the text as far as Gooder goes. Yeah. So if you don't know who Gooder is, they're an amazing sunglass company. Shout out to you guys. No, they're not our client. Do I would love to work with them? Of course. It has nothing to do with that, though. The thing about Gooder that makes them different is that they are a inexpensive sunglass brand that really does live up to their like potential, which is they don't break. They have lifetime guarantees. They are unbelievable. But when you look at all their ads right now, they don't scream anything having to do with that. And that is where I like to look at this. And again, going back to being authentic, the running community wears gooders because they stay on their face. They are comfortable and you can literally buy a million of them and not feel like you've broken the bank. But they could also match every one of your running outfits. So for races and things like that. If you go to facebook.com backslash ads backslash library and look at any of these ads, it doesn't scream active. Right now, they have ones that are like a classic shape for every face, which is cute because they have sunbathing with wizards. They have a dog wearing them. If we click to the right a little bit on the carousel ad, I'm sure there's more. Um, and then they also do a lot. When it comes to, yeah, there's tons there, funny enough, like flamingos on a booze cruise, like wearing just sunglasses on every face, which is true. But at the same point, as funny as that is, are you really putting your sunglasses on a dog or on a flamingo? To be authentic <laughs> to this brand, I would rather see it on every different kind of shape of human than just dogs. Or at least have maybe one animal and then the rest be silly. Like the wizard is fun playing upon that. You could even have a witch or Santa or like a mensch or like you could go down the whole entire road of holiday theme of different faces during this time of year. Um, they do have game day ones, which is coming. Um, and they do... I know this about this brand, which is they create sunglasses specifically for um, different sports teams and everything like that. So I don't mind this, though you would obviously want to target if it was me, I would actually target specific and have people wearing these exact sunglasses at those colleges and having more fun with it and being able to have like a college student or an alumni with them because that would raise way more eyebrows than just the picture of them. The big thing here, and not that they do. So let me just preface this. I think that Gooder does their marketing really, really well. I was surprised on the ads right now of what is running because it was more shocking to me because this is just such a fun brand that there's so much more that can be done. So when we look at this, especially, and I know Jeremy showing it on the screen, but it is a video and it has like no slip, no bounce, all polarized, all fun. These stylish shades are ready when you are. This is a video and it's on, it's running right now on Facebook and Instagram. If I really dove into this in the ad details, most likely it's on stories and in reels and things like that. The problem is, is that when we play it, it is still very commercial. It is a production. Someone's at a club, then on the 
beach. It's the same woman. She's having a great time. And while that's great, talking about this, yes, showing and yes, having a good time, but you have this very loud, obnoxious text and text is crucial in ads right now, but within the, you have this music, you have someone speaking over it as if you're on a commercial on TV and you have the text. It is everything social is not right now. Really, this should be even that woman talking as if she was at the club. Like, I'm having so much fun and showing her jump up and down. And then in the next place, same kind of thing, like talking. It shouldn't be the voiceover as though you, I I always think about those commercials, like the pharmaceutical commercials that have the voiceover that's like, and this is everything wrong you could be having right now. That's what this feels like to me. And not that they're saying this is everything wrong you can have, but it feels like the presence of someone talking down to you instead of talking to you. And that is where I would suggest, Gooder, if you ever want to talk, um, to change this kind of style, because right now that is not going to get new consumers in. Love it. Audra, I want to be the first one to thank you. Um, I think everyone should check out Brem Media. B R E H M media.com to learn more. And just thank you so much for sharing all of your stories and expertise. Thank you, Jeremy. I had a blast. I swear I won't make this happen. Like I will let this happen again. I was, it wasn't too scary. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Audra. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.